All right, I'll have Jack Gibson here with me on the Mentor Forge podcast. Excited to have Jack. Jack with is with my indestructible wealth. Jack, how you doing today? I'm doing great. All right. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it's good to have you. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the first question right off the bat, Jack, what's um yeah, I guess thinking back to you growing up or even in, you know, your early 20s, what were some of your um being the finance guy? What's the what were your earliest influence related to success and, and generally overall wealth? Yeah. You know, I, I honestly have the rich dad, poor dad story in real life. I mean, not to say that my real father was poor because he wasn't, he was a middle earner, you know, middle income earner, slightly above uh, as a professional. Mm -hmm. And then um, I also had my wealthy uncle who had three uh, businesses. He was an entrepreneur. Uh, he was, he farmed 500 acres. He had a million dollar insurance book. And then he also did a tent table and share business. <clears throat> he had no children of his own. So, you know, I was like the de facto, you know, child for him. I looked at him, um, as a, you know, a father figure as well. And so it was really interesting to have kind of both see both sides of the game, the job world and the entrepreneurial world. Right. When, um, when my uncle passed, he, he passed with, uh, probably 3.5, $4 million and nobody would have ever known. I mean, he lived extremely frugal. Wow. Uh, in fact, in his, in his bedroom, when, when the, uh, you know, when they kind of were tearing down the house and everything, the, the wallpaper was like falling down in his house. Like he wouldn't <laughs> spend his money. <laughs> and another thing I remember that there was a couple incidences with him that really stand out. I remember when I was a senior in high school and the Cleveland Indians made the world series. Hmm. And this is a huge deal. I mean, we, we still to this day have no championships since 1948. So it's, it's really rough. Wow. <laughs> it's been a long yeah. stretch. And so it was really, you know, like I saved up, I had, uh, you know, 400 bucks, uh, you know, as a senior in high school, I was ready to let her rip. Mm -hmm. So I called him up and, you know, he's the only one I knew that loved Cleveland and loved the, the team and had money. And he's like, nah, I work too hard for my money. Uh -huh. And I'm like, man, really disappointed in that kind of thought or philosophy because you can't take it with you. Right. Right. Yeah. So you learn the, like the good from people. And then you can also learn like, oh man, what's the, like, what's, what do I not want to take away from them? Mm -hmm. And so that kind of like, that hit me in a way where I'm like, man, I don't want to be like that. I want to be able to make awesome money as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but I also want to enjoy it all along the journey. Like yeah, life is, can be really short and it was short for him at 56. So that was my um, kind of like in, in initial, um, you know, journey as, as far as kind of going up into the into the twenties, right? Right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, unpack that a little bit for me. How do we balance that? Um, because we all got. I mean, I'm sure you get like I mean, different personalities, different. Some lean towards saving, some lean towards spending. How do we enjoy our money, but also provide for the future? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think so much of traditional finance, which I kind of my platform is all about disrupting that. Yeah. So it's a lump sum thinking. So what I mean by that is you, your goal is to and this is the Wall Street push, right, which they generate a lot of fees off of people. So there's a lot of there's a hidden agenda behind this big push to accumulate a large nest egg by the time you're 65 and then your goal is to have saved up enough hmm. to where then you can just draw that down and hopefully you make it long enough to where your you your money doesn't um you know uh you don't outlast your money so to speak right <laughs> my strategy has been multiple streams of income and not so much focus on the lump sum i mean the lump sum is certainly it is important because the, the the sum of money that you have accumulated is can be put into projects or investments that create cash flow. Mm -hmm. But it's not the main focus. The main focus is on um, the way I think is I want multiple streams of cash flow, passive income. Huh. So that 
if one dries up or or to dry up, which I expect that to happen in a highly disruptive, you know, economy and with technology uh, shifting so fast. Mm -hmm. My expectation is that some of my streams will dry up. It's almost inevitable. But then I, so I always want to be in a position where I don't care that much when that happens. Right. Right? Uh, yeah. So huh. I can live my life now and enjoy it. And we have an incredible lifestyle. Um, don't no worries about spending and and all of that we can buy whatever we want whenever we want mm -hmm. and also don't have any worries about the future because we have plenty of streams multiple yeah. enough streams of income coming in to where i don't really i don't need to accumulate any more um yeah. lump sum by the time i'm 65 it won't make any difference huh so how did you get there to that mindset I mean, was that a natural bent to you? You felt even at a young age that you had an entrepreneurial mindset or is that something you developed in create in like in understanding money and how to really bring how to, yeah, how to gra start having multiple streams of income? Yeah, I read, uh, it wasn't anything natural. I don't think, I don't know. It's, it's not too natural. I had, I had a love of money early on. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah. My mom, my mom, came out of the uh the nursery school mm. and this this gal that was teaching it she said hey did you know jack knows how to count money like he did it accurately and i was only like three right so oh, wow. it was very abnormal and my mom's like yeah yeah it's like of course he does he's he loves money <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um but it it took a lot of uh setbacks you know to be able to kind of figure out the strategy that i have today and feel really strong and passionate about it mm -hmm. um, when i was 22 i'd saved up fifty thousand dollars through college i wow. yeah i got involved in a direct sales and marketing company uh hustled like crazy you know all the other college kids are drinking and partying and playing video games and mm -hmm. you know just doing what college kids do right yeah <laughs> I um, not only got through school, got my degree, but uh, I also built a really nice business up and I saved everything. I didn't spend, I didn't spend anything. I was so cheap. My yeah. friends made fun of me and they should have, <laughs> should have let it rip a little bit more, Right. Mm -hmm. but I wanted to create wealth early. I wanted to become a millionaire by age 30. That was always the goal. So I invested it into the stock market because the stock market was cranking. And, you know, the previous, so this was 2000, right? So you probably mm -hmm. know where this story is going, <laughs> put it into, I put it all in yeah. and within like three months, it's down 50% because the, it's called the dot-com bubble crash. Mm -hmm. So my timing was impeccably terrible. Yeah. And that really set me back for, you know, set me back for a few years. I mean, and not only uh, financially, but it set me back emotionally because I lost confidence in like mm. that ability to build wealth because it, yeah. it, it also scared, it scared me. I was it's like, I worked so hard for this money and then for it to just kind of half of it to disappear and overnight, that sucks. Yeah. So I realized I needed to learn a different game. And that's when I picked up the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. And he talked about really hyper-focusing on two things. Number one, build a business that produces excess cash flow that's very scalable and then to take that cash flow and invest it into cash flow producing assets that when you buy them you're not gambling you're not speculating you know when you buy it what approximately what kind of returns you're going to get so that shifted my entire focus that book was incredible mm -hmm. and then um that's been the that's been the uh, journey ever since for the since you know age 22 now i'm 43 right so yeah, how would you, I mean, I guess, describe your mindset? Is it, I mean, it just sounds like, yeah, that you were kind of putting a lot of trust and hope in the system uh, or, or just your ability to save and to earn. And, and now how would you describe it now different? Would you describe it differently in the context of just outside of just what you learned from the, from the book? How would you say you're different? Um, I think that there's a lot of the core components that are, yeah. you know, that are still there. Like that's still the strategy. However, mm -hmm. I've realized over the last few years that 
I have missing pieces to the strategy. Mm -hmm. So one thing that happened that just, I mean, absolutely floored me mm -hmm. and made me reevaluate what I was doing. This guy comes into our, our little, uh, I call it like, it's like a little smoothie shop. My wife runs and he said, uh, he's a landscaper, a uh, Lance landscaper. And he has struggles with his business. I know it. I'm in an entrepreneurial group with him mm -hmm. and he has a lot of trouble, you know, with that business and getting the right employees and stuff to get the right people, <clears throat> retain them and get the good quality people. So he had, uh, told me, you know, we got into a conversation about cryptocurrency and he bought Bitcoin, 10 Bitcoin when it was at a thousand. And so at that time, yeah. you know, Bitcoin was, I think at that conversation was probably around 50,000. Wow. And obviously, you know, it got up to 64. It's, you know, it's hovering right around, you know, 50 right now. Mm -hmm. And so he created 500,000 off a $10,000 investment. And then on top of that, I find out another conversation. He bought like a hundred Ethereum at, you know, super cheap. And that's mm -hmm. cranked like crazy. True. So I was like, man, I could have done that. Like I was listening to podcasts uh, where Mike Dillard adamantly said, buy Ethereum and Bitcoin. And it was probably right there on that time that he bought. Mm -hmm. But I was so hyper-focused in, in building the business and investing in a cash flow producing assets I wouldn't speculate at all so right. so it just added in this layer to where now the plan has this has when the time is right I call it you take some well-timed swings for the fences huh. just like a major league baseball player when the timing is right they need to put a bunt down and sometimes the timing is right of the situation where they need to let a rip the, the odds are stacked in their favor. The matchup is right. The t you know, everything's lined up. Boom. They're going to swing for the fences. Huh. Maybe they strike out. Yeah. Maybe they crank it out. Right. Yeah. So that kind of led to me to what I call the, it's, I have a five stage process. There's five stages mm -hmm. that if you follow the stages, there's almost, there's, there's almost no way that you won't win. Yeah. If you, the problem that most people have in investing is that they don't have their foundationals plan or strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're over speculating and even over gambling. And that's a very, um, not a methodical way to build wealth. It's a very up and down cyclical market, cyclical uh, type of plan that you're, you're really putting yourself out there in terms of the whims of the market could whip your uh, seesaw, your wealth and uh, really disrupt, you know, your whole life. Right. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. So, oh man, a lot of thoughts there, but the, yeah, I, I just, yeah, the, it's just interesting. I think so many people make big decisions like that off of feelings and it sounds like your stages kind of cuts out the, the feelings part of it. And yeah, you it really does. Have a understanding of when to swing for the fences in a very yeah. yeah go ahead. So it's yeah, absolutely. So I'll just I'm, I'll go through them real quick. Um, yeah. Stage stage one is investing into yourself. So if I look back at what I should have done when I was 22 versus what I did do, right? I I skipped from stage instead of doing stage one, I went to all the way to stage four. And so stage one, when you invest in yourself, it's four things. When people ask, like, well, what do you invest into when you say invest into yourself? Books, um, courses, coaching, and seminars. So those are the four things that I think are the most important when you're first getting started. And this is speaking to, yes, I'm speaking to entrepreneurs for sure, but for employees that really want to build wealth and retire young, they're going to need to have a side hustle. It's extremely difficult to build wealth and retire by the time you're 40, mm -hmm. which I have, I'm financially, completely financially retired. Wow. There's a, there's a difference between financially retired and work retired too. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll never work retire. I'll work until I'm, mm. you know, until I'm, until I'm done. Right to some capacity, I probably will slow down and enjoy golf and, and right at some stage, mm -hmm. but, uh, financially retired is 
gives you a lot more freedom and choices. So, so we did that by age 40. And I say the only way to really do that is that you, you do need to have a side hustle. You need to have a business to do that. Mm-hmm. You, you just, it's so very difficult, even as a high earning employee to retire young because you're taxed to death. You're, you're taxed yeah. at the highest bracket. You don't have any, hardly any advantages that a business owner has that it's, it's just, it's almost so hard. It's, it's hard as an employee to out earn or outpace the taxes that you're paying. Mm. So stage one, if you invest into yourself, then you're what I call you're exponentially increasing your earning power. That's the whole focus. Let's just get your skills strong. You need specialized skills. If you went to college, which I did, I got a lot of generalized knowledge, which was fine. It, it wasn't practical in the business sense. I made, I'm, I learned 10 times to a hundred times more being in sales and in the market while I was going to college than I actually learned from college out of a textbook and from a teacher that never even built a business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it is what it is. Yeah. So I uh, had a great experience, had fun, had some great parties, met some great people. But, you know, at the end of the day, what good did that do me in business? It really didn't. Right. So, and I'm not bashing college because I think for professionals and certain people, it's necessary. I was just with my wife and I were kind of talking about this, but there's a lot of, a lot of, it's pushed on, on a lot of young kids that it isn't very necessary for them to go. Mm-hmm. They just feel like they have to based on what society says is necessary in order to be successful. And I, I totally disagree. Yeah. So anyways, you get uh, super hyper-focused on building your skills and then, and, and then um, your whatever specific passion that you have. So you got to figure out what is it that you most enjoy doing. The way to figure out what your passion is, is just look at what is it that you read books about? Mm-hmm. What do you listen to podcasts about? And you know, what, what kind of uh, court, like, courses or seminars? What do you find yourself like just reading content about? That's typically what you would say your passion would be. Mm -hmm. So for me, my passion is like, I looked it up my library and it's all, it's like so many 50% of them are finance books, right? (laughs) Investing cash flow, Like, so it wasn't that hard for me to figure out indestructible wealth. This is the platform and brand that I should launch now. Yeah. So once you've got your invested into yourself and you got your skills built up, then stage two is, you know, building your own cash flow producing business. Mm. And the goal with that is to build it up to where you have so much cash flow coming in that it no longer makes sense to keep pouring that money back into back into the business. So in stage two, you're really hyper focused on constantly reinvesting back into your own business. Mm -hmm. So give you an example. Okay. So I just, I launched indestructible wealth. I'm i uh, I'm seven months in. Hmm. Okay. And how did I approach this? Even though I'm really not in stage two of like the whole financial picture for my whole life. Yeah. But for this particular business, I'm in stage two. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm hyper investing into this business. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm doing uh I just hired a TikTok coach, which is hilarious. I'm 43 and I, <laughs> I hired a TikTok coach, right? It's so it's comical. Right. I don't dance. Um, but there are, I have found like on that particular platform, there are lots of people who are doing really well in finance that don't dance, they just give great content. Mm-hmm. And I hired a LinkedIn coach and he helps me with my posts and revising them and the content and learning the platform more effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, I've taken a YouTube course. I just paid a few hundred bucks to to take a YouTube course because I need to repurpose my content onto YouTube since it's evergreen and it's going to be there for the next several years whenever you post a video, right? Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you know, I have a business coach that helped me come up with the idea and strategize for this. And then on top of that, Brand Builders uh, is the company that, you know, you and I both went with to teach us how to build a personal brand. Yeah. So you look at all of that, that's a quite an, like, that's an investment, but that's an investment into me to increase my, exponentially increase my earning power in this particular mm-hmm. business that I've chosen. And number two, I'm pouring money back into the business. I, I've got SEO guys that yeah. are trying to get me ranked 
high on search engines. Mm -hmm. I've got, um, you know, all the, the coaches and all of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's the website design hosting, like everything is hyper-focused on mm -hmm. stages one and two with this particular business. Yeah. So I, I really want to keep on these stages cause it's really fascinating. I'm kind of taking notes myself, but, uh, I really want to back up here and just it, it, to the person who says, you know, that's too much of an investment. I don't have the money to do that or the income to, I mean, what would you say to that person who to, I, I can't get a brand builders, YouTube coach, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, number one, I would say that uh, money is an idea. Ah, yeah. So your limiting your um you, you might have limited resources but you have unlimited resourcefulness mm. so i think to sometimes having a lot of money is almost a i wouldn't say it's a crutch but it it can hinder me a bit mm -hmm. because i'm not as careful of of what i spend on mm -hmm. and i'm almost maybe there's an over reliance on like utilizing the money as the weapon to grow versus desire, hustle, heart, um, ingenuity, you know, just really getting after it. Right. So for example, as somebody who's 22, 23, they're listening to this, like, I don't have much money. I'm like, well, you, you probably have a lot more energy and you have a lot more time than I have now at 43. Yeah. You know, you do have a lot more energy in the, in your twenties. It's, it's, it's the way it, it's how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, but you have a lot more, uh, there's a lot more drive. Like I, I got almost, I, I grinded so long in mm -hmm. business over throughout my twenties, like, you know, 13, 14, 15 hour days mm -hmm. that I don't want to do that anymore. So I won't work nearly as hard. So you have that as an advantage. Mm -hmm. You're willing to, and more hunger, you're willing to work harder and longer hours. Mm -hmm. So they can probably beat me in this game by just make, by having desire and heart and hustle mm -hmm. and, you know, ingenuity right. and, and ideas and understanding inherently, they understand social media a lot more than I do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So saving time just by knowing how to operate that. Yeah. Exactly. Just yeah. knowing the platform, they they could probably beat me by a year of learning curve or two mm -hmm. and all of just knowing all the features and how to, how to really communicate on those platforms. Mm -hmm. So they can't think that they don't just cause they don't have money. Like there's ways to do, to start building, you know, with, with very limited uh, money, but they can't let that as if you use that as an excuse, you're, you're pretty much, you're done. Yeah. You're dead in the water. Cause everybody has to go through that pretty much that process of not having that much money and getting going and figuring out how to bootstrap. Yeah, the, the thing that you hit on, I, I really, I know I struggled with was the idea of my earning potential. Like I struggled at college, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of my friends, you know, got, you know, the engineering or the pre-med degrees. And so they like, in my mind, they had earning potential because of their, their ability to do school. Like, and so how do you reframe and help people that really like, you know, and, and it's, it was, it's been years for me to kind of work myself. It's like, no, there's just so many other things that you can do valuable skills. I mean, I guess that's part of investing in yourself, reading books, yeah, realizing how, how does someone in their twenties, even in their thirties start to develop, believing that they have earning potential outside of the generic norms. Yeah. I mean, the mind really can't, can tell the difference between something that's real or vividly imagined. So yeah, there's so many books and studies that show that, you know, your subconscious will accept anything that your conscious mind feeds it good, good or bad. So essentially, that's coming down to say, whatever you believe you can achieve, you will. And if you believe you can't, then you won't. Yeah. So one thing that a uh, trick that I always do is I have to kind of trick my mind in it, believing and really uh, visualizing the next level of earning power. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, it couldn't be so unbelievable that like, I didn't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, right, right. You know, so when I'm making, you know, a thousand a month, I wasn't thinking a hundred thousand a month, right? I was, mm -hmm. 
I was making a thousand a month. So I'd say, I'm so happy and grateful that I'm earning $5,000 a month. And I just say that that was my uh, simple, nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. I'll just keep repeating that to myself all the time. It's kind of seems silly, but it works. Then I'll go, I hit 5,000. I'm like, I'm so happy and grateful that I'm hitting $10,000 a month. Uh, or I just say, I am earning over $10,000 a month. Yeah. And you say, I am, I am, I am. Because you're, you're, again, your mind can't tell the difference between uh, whether it's future oriented or, or in the past or present, it doesn't know. Mm. So if I keep projecting out where I want to go, then my mind's going to figure out the best logical um, and most efficient course to get me there. Mm. And that will then attract the books, the coaches, the people, the resources, the team, everything I need uh, will be starting to move towards me because again, everything is energy. So now it's, you know, I'm earning over a hundred thousand dollars per month. And now I gotta, I'm gonna have to raise that up because we've, I've, I've hit that. Yeah. So now it's gonna be, I gotta, I gotta figure out, okay, what's the next level? And what is it that I believe? Mm -hmm. That's possible. Okay. Well, I think the next logical place to go is I'm earning $250,000 a month. So that's what I need to start telling myself. I'm earning over $250,000 a month. So it's this constant recalibration. You have to recalibrate. You have to keep um, not getting stuck in just being kind of like at the same place and okay with where you're at. I think too, what's most important for people to understand is that money is very, very important. And this is coming from a guy who has a indestructible wealth platform on finances, yeah. but it's only one fifth of the whole picture of wealth. Yeah, there's financial wealth, which is very, very important to say that money isn't important in today's mm -hmm. life and in American life is <laughs> we know that is right way off track. It is very, very important mm -hmm. in the areas of which it's very important in and it's all important in the areas of which it's not important in. Mm -hmm. Um you know, when my wife's, you know, pissed off at me, all the money in the world doesn't solve that problem. Like, yeah. I've got to, you know, I can't bribe her, or throw money at her. It's, <laughs> I got to figure out, okay, I got to, right? yeah. <laughs> I got to get better. <laughs> I got to figure this one out. This is, uh -huh. this is where we got to work on the second part of wealth relationships, mm. or spiritual wealth. There's, um, intellectual wealth and then there's um physical physical wealth health and that's they're all very 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 important if you take one of those away you're not a happy as a human being you're not living a really you're not living a good life yeah just being honest if one of those is in the tanker right mm -hmm. so that's what um i would be giving the main advice to people in their 20s if i could really go back in time and talk to myself, I'd, I'd really say, you know, pursue a holistic view of wealth, not just Holy. be so hyper focused on money, that you kind of lose sight of all the other areas of life, which create richness and fullness and fulfillment and happiness. Yeah. Yeah, that is just one of five. That's it's really one, it's it, it literally is 20% of the game. Yeah. yeah. Huh, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of what I, I wish I told myself. And I tell a lot of the guys is like, going back to that investing yourself thing, learning to grow. And so that, you know, it's almost like, you know, most of the time you hear these stories of these billionaires and famous people that just kind of come to the peak of life, but yet destruction follows them athletes, all those stories. And it's a lot of, you know, I had a mentor tell me it's, is generally their success outgrew their character. Yeah. And it's like, we want to grow our character with our success. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You want your character, your personal development to be outpacing your earning power. Mm. So that way, your your money has to catch up to the person that you are. Yeah. But if you're in the reverse position where your success is higher than your character, then that's a bad place to be because your money has to catch up to who you are. And it's come, it's going to be coming on the downward trajectory. Ooh. Inevitably. You know, we see it all the time mm -hmm. with people who earn wealth quickly or get a hold of money that they didn't earn. They didn't have to become the yeah. person, you know, they, they lose it. They can't handle it. Right. Oh man.
that's interesting. All right, so what's stage three? I'm curious. Yeah, stage three is invest into cash flow producing assets. This is mainly real estate. Um, it doesn't have to be real estate, but most cash flow producing assets are going to be under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. Now, there's different ways you can do real estate. Um, when I first started off, you know, it was, it was single family homes. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've done well with them. I've also not done well. I mean, sometimes they don't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I just had one though, uh, just closed a couple of days ago. I bought it for 80,000 back in 2015 and just sold it for 230 and cash flowed it for the last six years. Uh, it rented out every single month. So the cash flow itself would, I would have been totally happy with. Mm -hmm. But then the property also appreciated and in, in substantially, right? So that's a win. You know, not all of them go that way. Some uh, have been a disaster, you know, where the, the roof needs replacement and, you know, there's peel off six, seven grand. And so yeah. I don't want to paint it as like, oh yeah, it's always good. It's not. Mm -hmm. um, you got tenants, toilets, and trash. And those three aren't always uh, <laughs> are great. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then, um, you know, there's, uh, you can buy mortgage back notes where you just kind of like the bank. So you hold the note and you mm. get the cash flow as if you're the bank. Those are great. Mm. There are syndication deals where you can buy in a piece of equity in a larger deal, like a multifamily mm. or a self storage deal. I'm gearing more towards those now because single family homes are not a passive investment. It, people can say that they're passive all day long and I, they are not right. <laughs> passive. When you have tenants, toilets and trash, you'll just, even if you have a good management company, you won't be able to escape the um, active nature of that game. Mm -hmm. So I'm gearing now at this stage of life, self storage um, and um, you know, things that are, are where I don't have to be involved much. One thing I really like the idea of for the younger generation, I'll be uh, diving into this more on my show, is fractionalized real estate. So this is using the blockchain technology, uh, cryptocurrency essentially, or the blockchain technology is what powers the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it allows people uh, anywhere in the world to own a piece of US real estate for as little as $50. There are programs out there that allow you to do that. And it gives you the benefits of full benefits of as if you had the full rights to the property. I mean, you get the same percentage of the cash flow based on how much you put in, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it allows people to get into real estate at a young age that don't have the money or the, the knowledge or the experience to be able to say, purchase a full home themselves and take on that level of risk. And they get, they start getting that cash flow coming in from that asset ownership. And it's very liquid. You can sell the, you can sell that uh, token pretty quickly. It's very, very liquid, which real estate generally is not liquid. So I like this idea. I think this is probably the future of real estate, to be honest, as far as cash flow real estate for younger um, you know, hungry, you know, men and women that really want to get into the game, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit, um, maybe they're not ready to financially, or they're not ready to take on that commitment that, um, is involved with owning the, the house and the whole title and the deed yourself. Right. Yeah. So what's stage four and five? Stage four, this is, this is fun. This is where it gets fun. Everybody's oh, like, when does, okay. this, when does this really get fun? <laughs> this <doesn't, laughs> it hasn't sounded that much fun. Like, when do I buy the Doge coin that goes to the moon? Or right. when do I get the Bitcoin, the Ethereum, um, and, and take uh, the high, the high risk tech stock bet that, you know, can go up 10 X. When do I get to do that? Jack, you're stifling me. I understand. Yeah. Um, Stage four is you take the income that you're getting from stages one through three. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's think about this for a second. You've, your earning power has exponentially increased because you've been investing back into yourself and your skills are strong. You can make money at any, in any business. At, like yeah. I, if you drop me off into pretty much any business, I believe that I can figure it out how to make money and do yeah. it well. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I'm on my third business now. I've built two multi-million dollar businesses. Um, I have 12 streams of cash flow. I'm on my third, although I haven't monetized this one yet. I, the plan is emotion is in place. I'll know that I'll be able to make a million dollars off this platform. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that may take five years. I don't know. I know I'll do it. Right. So that's that, just that confidence in your mindset, your skills and your belief where stage one is earning power. You can earn money. Yeah. No doubt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you got that earning power. You got your business from stage two producing excess cash flow. You got your assets now producing cash flow in stage three. So yeah. you have streams, multiple streams of income coming in, some from active and some passive in nature, right? right. You take that money and now you get to speculate with it. You get to <laughs> you get to you get to take some swings for the fences. Yeah. Here's what's great. Okay, here's the best part about this strategy. If that money should uh, that deal doesn't work out, okay, mm -hmm. they're higher risk, they're but they're higher reward. So some of them will fall flat. You will lose all your money in some of these deals that you do in stage four. Huh. But it doesn't matter because your money will be replenished typically within a few months, maybe within, maybe within a year, depends how aggressive you got on your stage four bet. But your money will be replenished. Your lifestyle isn't affected. And boom, you re-swing for the fences again. And then something's going to hit something's going 10 X in stage four, or even a hundred X. And this is where, bam, you move the needle on your net worth, like seriously, like crazy movement. Right. right? Mm -hmm. This was me where I made in uh, two months, I made 300,000 on cryptocurrency. That was what happened is because wow. I was in stage four, but I was also responsible about getting to stage four. Mm -hmm. When crypto dropped, you know, recently we had a pullback of 50% pullback when Elon Musk decides that for whatever reason, uh, he doesn't like Bitcoin anymore, which is it's a, it's a whole different podcast. <laughs> right? Bitcoin drops, all the crypto market then plummets mm -hmm. by 50%. I didn't care. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I cared more about the golf shot that went into the water on the, the night before, because that really bothered me. Mm -hmm. the, the money that dropped, I don't care because I can hold, I can be patient. I looked at it as a buying opportunity. I'm like, celebrating. I'm like, I've got, you know, more money sitting yeah. on the sidelines. I like the bet that I made. I just got a 50% discount. Uh -huh. I bought I bought more Bitcoin, Ethereum, I bought Cardano. I went, bam, I'm, I'm buying more of all these coins that I really liked. Mm -hmm. And so now those are, that money's up. So you want it to be where, you know, if you're doing this process, the way I'm ex um, kind of laying out, right? You actually celebrate when the market drops. You're, you're not, you don't yeah. care. You don't care. Right. And that's why, that's because your lifestyle isn't affected if you're doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're placing investments like I did when I was 22, where I put all my money into the stock market yeah, and then it dropped by 50%. Mm. That affected my life in a big, big way. Mm -hmm. My lifestyle was affected. So that means I was in the wrong. I was going about it all wrong. Mm -hmm. Now when that happens, stock market could tank 50%. I, I couldn't, I could probably care less. Right. It's like that Warren Buffett mindset. When everybody's selling, that's when you need to be buying. When everybody's buying, that's when you need to be selling. Kind of yeah, mindset, basically. Absolutely. But yeah. you know, when there's blood in the streets, that's your opportunity. Yeah, huh. that's cool. So, but you're you have to have, you have to protect your principal money first, and that's what these young kids don't want to do. Yeah. And you know, I don't know how else to tell them. They're going to go out and they're going to buy the, do the doge the, to the moon and something worthless like that that has no intrinsic value. They're going to buy the GameStop, the AMC. They're going to try to get there because people want to get rich quick. That's, yeah. that's the, the basics of human nature is they want to make money as fast as humanly possible mm -hmm. with the least amount of effort. That is intrinsically built inside of us into our DNA. Okay. Yeah. Some of us have the better ability to handle that, but we all have it. No doubt. If yeah. the, that wasn't true, then why do people, millions and millions of people play the lottery, right? Right. <laughs> we, we know that's true. <laughs> so, when, yeah. 
you you've got to think how the wealthy think the wealthy think safety first huh. protect your principal money don't gamble don't speculate with that early state seed money get that into stages one two and three and then speculate one just one thing to add in uh real quick is you don't have to like if you're 22 25 right yeah you could play a i would say you could play a little bit in stage four but if mm -hmm. it's only going to be like 10 maybe 20 percent of your total investable dollars mm -hmm. because you have so much ability to recover yeah the older that you get you have less time to to recover so you want to be you want to be more, more and more careful with your principal money. Mm -hmm. But overall, the overriding theme is protect that money, safety first. Um, don't don't over speculate. Don't gamble with it. Protect it, and uh, then take the 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 money that that principal produces, mm -hmm. and then that's the money that you use to 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 do your higher risk plays. Right. Uh, I know you're gonna ask me stage five. It's really quick. It's repeat stages one through four until you've got to where you want to be. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. um, always remember to give back and bless others because you're yeah. if you're in stage five, mm. you know, Carwright, you're in a unique position in life where mm. you've got a lot of streams of income coming in. You've got a lot of um, you know net worth, and you want to make sure to be a good steward of that money. And just uh, actually, uh, this week, I'm writing a check for 15 grand to help uh, build a church in Arizona. Wow, um, my the, the younger of two pastors at my church is moving to start a new church. Mm -hmm. um, and he needs the seed money to get it going. Mm -hmm. I've always said that I want to be a part of building a church. So mm -hmm. I put my money where my mouth is. So we're stroking a check, boom, that's part of the 10% yeah. of the house that just sold uh, in Arizona that I described. I'm taking 10% of those proceeds and boom, that's going to help build a church in Arizona. You, now, it's really easy to talk about doing it. It's a whole different thing to stroke the check. or Yeah. You know, it's a whole well, different story. Is that part of the process? I mean, I always talk about that. It's like you can't all of a sudden, well, I'll give when I'm making a lot of money. Is yeah. That, is that a discipline developed when you don't have the money really? To give? Yeah. Yeah. I started giving a good mm. 12, 13 years ago and we've been pretty, I mean, we've been very consistent. We, mm -hmm. we give 40, 50 grand a year easily. Um, and we've just been doing that. Uh, my advice is to start when the, the money is small mm. because you could say, all day long and you'd be kidding yourself to say well when i make a million dollars i give a hundred thousand no you won't hmm. you know how hard it is to give a hundred grand away that's a very difficult proposition yeah if you don't have that muscle developed so it is giving is a is a muscle that has to be worked mm -hmm. it's much better when the the money that's coming in is small mm -hmm. if you have a trouble with this concept start with one percent just take one percent you know a dollar out of a hundred you're not going to miss it at all yeah. Take five, take five dollars out of a hundred. Watch how your life is blessed. Watch how you feel. It's crazy. Well, there'll be some weird things that happen to you that you won't be able to explain. Yeah. That you're going to, it's going to just strengthen and solidify your belief in the value of giving and what you sow, you will reap. Mm -hmm. So start off um, now and it's going to give you a huge leg up on every everybody else because nobody's really doing it yeah oh yeah very, very few are doing that mm -hmm. that that sets you apart mm -hmm. it puts you in a position of incredible level of attractiveness in the marketplace yeah huh that's cool there's a lot of biblical concepts the sowing and reaping those who give will receive Mm -hmm. And one I always think about what, for what you're saying is is Abraham God said I'll bless you to bless others. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a very much uh, not a master of the Bible by any stretch. <laughs> In fact, I was just with my uh, pastor, he's my golfing buddy. Yeah. 
And I said, I, I, I need you to interpret it for me. Cause I don't, when I, I just don't get it when I read it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I said, plus I drop way, I drop way too many F bombs to, uh, <laughs> well, golf will teach you how to do that. That's yeah, <laughs> it really does. <laughs> so he's heard all, all kinds of colorful language out of me and, you know, Hey, you know, we're, we're still friends. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, well, here's some interesting facts about money relate with the Bible. You know, Jesus had 36 parables, 16 of them were about suiting money and resources. Wow. There's actually, more, I didn't know that there's more mo verses about money than there are about faith. Yeah. That's crazy to, that to think about, but the, yeah, yeah, money is, I know money is woven throughout the Bible, like a, a, huge amounts mm -hmm. and it's funny how people misinterpret it or twist it to money is the root of all evil or money is, you know, money is the root of all unhappiness. Mm. Those sort of things to me is kind of like the dad bod jokes that are going. Right. I feel yeah. like the dad bod is just a uh, worn out joke to hide somebody's lack of disciplines and lack of um, resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. Just like money is the root of all evil is is the same thing it's just a way to hide the fact that you weren't disciplined with your money yeah now people might not like me for saying that i don't care mm -hmm. um because i fight for people's goals and their dreams and sometimes you just need to get hit upside the head with something mm -hmm. the way it works is is the love of money is the root of all evil and then taking that down even further, it's when money gets into your heart too much to where now money is your primary, what you worship, right? There's nothing wrong with having huge abundances of money. If it doesn't affect your heart, if, right. it's, if it's affecting your heart, then it's a bad thing. And I agree with that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Money adds to your life. It doesn't, it isn't your life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're kind of coming on time here. So Jack, yeah, give me some where people can find you. Uh, maybe it's a great with some resources um, of yours that you know my audience would love to to have. Basically, yeah, uh, myindestructiblewealth.com is my central platform. So that's got uh, blogs, vlogs. It's got, I think I have about thirty five blogs on there as we speak. I have all my podcasts are posted right there with transcription. So mm. they they can access them right through that site. And then um, if they're interested in a financial mastermind, I'll be starting that very soon. It's a program that I'm designing to help people to make, keep and grow more money. Um, it'll be uh, starting off. It'll be on zoom. Mm -hmm. and guided one on they'll get a one on one call, they'll get uh, zoom calls, they'll get a private group. So it's really to help people that are younger with getting a hold of their finances and understanding, hopefully, try to teach them how to implement stages, you know, one through five, wherever, wherever they happen to be on their journey, right? So they can get on my email list, and then they'll be notified when uh, on my site, they'll be uh, notified when the next course is going to be opening up. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Well, Jack, I appreciate you coming on. This has been a blast. I could sit here and talk to you about this stuff all day. Yeah, no, I appreciate <laughs> the, uh, the the interview. I really enjoyed it, Carre. Right? Yeah. I could talk about it all day, too. You know, this, <laughs> this, is, uh, this, this is my passion. So I appreciate Absolutely. the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, man, I felt that passion. And so I really do appreciate it.